If you were able to join us for the last session, you would have had a wonderful treat as we saw some of the artists who have sailed on Falcor and got to hear some of their thoughts on what went into making that art that was inspired by the ocean, the science and the technology. So I want to welcome you now to the final session for today, where we'll, we will meet some of the aliens of the deep. I am delighted to introduce the moderator of this session, Dr. Richard Spinrad. Rick is a professor at the Oregon State University, a member of the Ocean Studies Board of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. He is a past president of the Marine Technology Society and former chief scientist of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, appointed in that position by President Barack Obama in 2014. In addition to being a Schmidt Ocean Institute Advisory Board member, he keeps himself busy these days as the vice chair of the US National Committee for the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So Rick, I will hand this panel over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jodica. Uh, and I'd like to start with a couple of thoughts on biodiversity before we introduce our keynote speaker. Anyone who's seen the movie The Abyss knows there's plenty of room for the imagination when it comes to deep ocean ecosystems. In fact, if you look up biodiversity in the dictionary, you'll get something dry and analytical like the variety of life in the world or in a particular habitat or ecosystem, unquote. But the truer description of biodiversity might come from this quote from uh, the renowned scientist and somewhat of a poet, E.O. Wilson, who said, biodiversity is the totality of all inherited variation in the life forms of earth of which we are one species. We study and save it to our great benefit. We ignore and degrade it to our great peril. This session will be a celebration of that totality of inherited variation in the deep sea described by a wonderful group of diverse scientists. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker is Kristen Yarensik. Kristen is the Vice President and Director of Research and Education and Director of the National Ocean Sciences Bowl at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which advances ocean research, education, and policy through a consortium of institutions from academia, aquaria, and industry. She previously served as Program Manager for the International Census of Marine Life Program coordinating its International Scientific Steering Committee and supporting its national and regional committees and global projects. Immediately after Kristen's keynote, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. So please feel free to send in your questions using the question key on the, uh, on the uh, site. And uh, as they might arise, we'll collect them and then open up a Q&A session immediately after Kristen's keynote speech. Kristen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rick, and thanks to SOI for putting on this exciting symposium and for the opportunity to speak in this session on aliens of the deep. My involvement in the census of marine life makes this a topic close to my heart, and I've really enjoyed the trip down memory lane in preparing for today. Next slide, please. Next, okay. So let's start this trip 26 years ago. The US National Committee published a report highlighting the importance of understanding marine biodiversity. The report begins, the diversity of life in the ocean is being dramatically altered by the rapidly increasing and potentially irreversible effects of activities associated with human population expansion. The activities referred to include overfishing, global climate change, physical alterations to coastal habitats, pressures we're all quite familiar with. The study points to serious challenges in determining the scope and impact of human activity on marine ecosystems because of our inadequate knowledge of the patterns and processes that control marine biodiversity. Knowledge that we must have to improve predictions of changes in the marine environment. It called for a national research agenda for marine biodiversity based on an integrated regional scale strategy that took advantage of recent, at the time, technological advances and cooperation with other programs necessary to accomplish this large scale research. Finally, the research agenda would require investment in taxonomic capacity. These messages should sound familiar because as I'll highlight, they continue to resonate through the marine biodiversity community. 
One of our panelists today, Les Watling, was a member of this study, as was the late Fred Grassley, who took this report and secured the interest of the Sloan Foundation to undertake a crazy idea called the Census of Marine Life. Next slide, please. The Census of Marine Life was an international program that ran from 2000 to 2010. It organized the marine biodiversity community around simple questions of diversity, distribution, and abundance. What kinds of organisms live in the ocean? What lives where? And how much of each lives? The census was largely a program of exploration and demonstration and encompassed many habitat types from the intertidal to the deep sea, including rocky shores, coral reefs, continental margins, seamounts, hydrothermal vents, and mid-ocean ridges. Over the 10 years, more than 500 expeditions and 2,700 scientists from 80 nations participated in 17 research projects that assembled what is probably still the most comprehensive baseline of marine biodiversity information in many parts of the world. So what did the census discover? Next slide, please. It tracked thousands of animals with acoustic and satellite tags and identified their migratory routes and pit stops. One of the special places found was the White Shark Cafe, where great white sharks journey as part of a migratory cycle. After these trips of up to 5,000 kilometers offshore, each shark would return to its exact starting location in California waters. But we didn't know what these sharks were doing in the White Shark Cafe until the Falcor visited this location in 2018 and found they go there to feed on squid and fish that are engaged in their own migration vertically. Next slide. The census affirmed that most marine life by weight is microbial, up to 90%. Census scientists assembled 18 million microbial DNA sequences from 1,200 sites globally and spanning more than 100 major phyla. Often samples contained only one or a few of a given kind of microbe, leading to a hypothesis that these now rare microbes could become dominant if environmental changes favor them. Next slide. Today we talk about the need for greater integration of disciplines and engaging social scientists in our work. The census was a pioneer in this bringing historians and ecologists together in an effort called the History of Marine Animal Populations. This project mined unique sources like restaurant menus and monastery records and found that historical human extractions of marine life are far broader in scope than once thought. In some regions like the Mediterranean, humans had 2000 years ago already removed consequential amounts of ocean life. Now a newly funded European project called Four Oceans will use these interdisciplinary techniques to further assess the historical connections between marine life and human societies and the consequences of resource exploitation. Next slide. Um, and we discovered new species, 1,200 of them, plus 5,000 potential new species collected but not confirmed by taxonomic description. A few of these shown here include an octopus and an amphipod both found in Antarctic waters, a blind lobster from the Philippines, and of course, the popular Yeti crab found on a vent in the Pacific Antarctic Ridge. Next slide. We also rediscovered species, such as this Jurassic shrimp found in the Coral Sea and thought to have gone extinct 50 million years ago. Next slide. The census used a suite of approaches and technologies and demonstrated significant new technology, such as DNA barcoding for species identification, animal telemetry to track movements over a great distance, and acoustic systems to measure abundances over tens of thousands of square kilometers. These technologies help to demonstrate biological observing capability for the Global Ocean Observing System, relatively young at that time, and the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network carries forward the legacy of integrating biology into global ocean observing. Next slide. The census established the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, now supported by UNESCO, to serve as um, data from the census and other programs. OBIS has grown from 7 million records in 2010 to 61 million today and serves as a global open access portal for marine biodiversity observations. Next slide. And importantly, the census built a community with momentum and passion to continue building our understanding of marine biodiversity. There were numerous legacy projects and expeditions. I've already mentioned a couple and I definitely don't have time to name them all, but there were legacy expeditions that benefited from the mission and support of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Now, these are not necessarily direct children of the census, but I think they encompass the spirit and certainly include connections to the census community. Hydrothermal exploration of the Mid-Cayman Rise in 2013 searched for life in extreme environments, 
In addition to panelist Julie Huber, the expedition included investigators from the census's <clears throat> Benson Steeps project. In 2019, Costa Rican DC connections included participation by census members Eric Cortes and Lisa Levin, as well as panelist Greg Rouse. And this expedition discovered at least four new species of deep sea coral. The 2020 expedition, Illuminating Biodiversity of the Ningaloo Canyons, is totally in the spirit of the census, discovering deep sea benthic biodiversity, as I'm sure you'll hear more from Greg later today. This expedition made the highly publicized discovery of a siphonophore that may be the longest animal ever discovered. That's the kind of discovery that received a lot of public attention during the census and continues to awe and inspire today. Next slide. The census marine life still serves as a model for research collaboration. And though it made significant achievements, our understanding of marine biodiversity remains incomplete today. Most of the ocean and therefore the earth remains unsampled. Most marine life observations are from shallower than 200 meters. There's been progress over the past decade, but we still have comparatively few records from the midwaters and especially below 3000 meters. After all its work, the census could not reliably estimate the total number of species in the ocean. With about 240,000 known marine species, not including microbes, it supported an estimate of at least 1 million marine species. But census researchers continued this quest. In 2011, Camilo Mora and colleagues estimated 2.2 million species, basically meaning that more than 90% of species in the ocean were still undescribed. In 2012, Ward Appleton's et al. refined the estimate to a range of 750,000 to a million species, indicating that between one third and two thirds of marine species may be undescribed. And in 2017, Mark Costello and co-authors estimated that we have only about a third of marine species left to describe with an estimated total number of species at 300,000. So I think we don't really know how many species await our discovery, but maybe we're closer than we thought a decade ago. And a question that continues to haunt scientists is how many species are disappearing due to human impact before we have discovered them and identified their role in the ecosystem. Other questions that remain after the census and still today include, how do species diversity, distribution, and abundance vary in space and time? How do the dispersal and movements of species, individuals, or genes connect populations and ocean locations? How is biodiversity linked to ecosystem services? What is the functional role of rare species and how do viruses, um, how do species from viruses to whales interact in the delivery of services? How is marine life changing and what drives those changes? What are the cumulative and interactive impacts of climate and human disturbance on biodiversity and the ecosystem services it provides? And how do we maintain, rebuild, and restore ocean resilience and ecosystem functions and services in the face of a changing ocean? Next slide. These questions were raised at a January 27th virtual symposium organized by the Consortium for Ocean Leadership that held a community dialogue around the need, opportunities, and critical elements of a new coordinated program in marine biodiversity research and observations. Jodica Vermani was one of our panelists at this event, and I thank SOI for participating, and also a cheap plug that the recording of the event is available at the link on the slide. Um, at the event, there was wide consensus amongst participants that we do need a new coordinated effort because there's still so much we don't know about life in the ocean, especially in Southern polar, um, polar latitudes and deep sea and midwaters. The discussion highlighted exciting new tools and technologies available now that we didn't have a decade or two ago during the Census of Marine Life. We discussed eDNA and in-situ omics tools, but noted that fewer than 1% of marine animal species have been sequenced already, and perhaps we should set a goal of sequencing 30% by 2030. We also noted the need for more complete reference libraries to utilize DNA technologies to their full potential, and that we still need taxonomic capacity. A true census or count of at least some megafauna may be possible with high resolution satellites that are capable of monitoring colonies and even individuals and give us better reach into remote locations. More and more, we have low cost tools like plankton scope that makes it possible to observe the behavior of planktonic organisms in the water column. And most importantly, can help us democratize science and engage underserved communities and the public. And with our remote and autonomous platforms capturing image and video, the power of machine learning to help automate classifications and analysis is critical. 
Making our data open and easily accessible will enable us to crowdsource our computing problems to those with expertise to solve them. With so many tools at our disposal, coordination was the strongest point throughout the symposium. Effective assessment of change requires sustained long-term observations and process studies that we can only accomplish working together as a community. And doing that means systematic and standardized approaches and methods for calibrating data across programs and data sets. The Census of Marine Life's efforts to synthesize data from different habitats and regions highlighted the challenges that come with variable sampling and survey approaches. And we have an opportunity to do better. Next slide. The marine biodiversity community is organizing to make process uh, progress under the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable, Sustainable Development, which launched this year. Two notable efforts proposed for the decade are centered on community collaboration and standard approaches and include participation from SOI. Challenger 150 is focused on global deep sea biological research and capacity building, and Marine Life 2030 spans habitats shallow and deep and seeks to unite technologies, partners, and partners into a global network to advance observation and forecasting of marine life. And I apologize to any other marine biodiversity proposals out there that I have not mentioned. Next slide. So to summarize this look back at marine biodiversity research for the decade ahead, we're facing the same types of human pressures on the ocean and arguably more of them as we were 26 years ago when a panel of experts called for urgent action toward understanding marine biodiversity. We've made tremendous discoveries and progress, but we still have many species left to discover. And we're still asking many of the same questions around the patterns, processes, and drivers of marine biodiversity and how humans are impacting those. Every decade presents us with promising new technologies for discovery and for more easily scaling observation of marine life. And this one is no different. Exploration will remain important given the gaps in our marine biodiversity data. And we need to combine that with sustained observation to build the time series we need to understand and monitor change. To meet the challenges we face, new efforts in marine biodiversity research and observation hinge on widespread collaboration. Because as a community, we have important and exciting questions to answer together. And I look forward to hearing what our panelists today have to say about our past discoveries, biggest opportunities, and how we might move forward together like these sea cucumbers. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for a uh, wonderful Cook's tour of what's happening in uh, marine biodiversity. I'd like to uh, open the floor up to questions. We started to get some already. Um, perhaps I can start by uh, starting where you started, and that is with the report from the Ocean Studies Board, uh, which was a truly remarkable report and also had a number of very interesting policy implications for federal agencies, for the NGO community, for academia. And I'm wondering, you talked a little bit about um, the UN decade, but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to give us your perspective on what uh, policy changes you think might be most uh, valuable in the context of understanding uh, deep ocean biodiversity? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think policy needs to, there, there, at least from a U.S. perspective, because I think that's what I can provide, there hasn't been a lot of integration of, of biodiversity uh, in policy making, it, definitely not in the oceanscape. Um, and so I think a, a greater recognition of the need to understand biodiversity, um, you know, in terms of conserving it, you know, there's the 30 by 30 plans, um, and there's references to things like um, gap analyses, but there is more we need to do than just gap analyses. We need to have um, investments and, and authorizations for, um, for programs that are gonna help us improve our capacity to observe marine life in a sustained way. And I, I think we're really missing that right now. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about um, variability in biodiversity uh, between tropics and high latitudes. Specifically, how does the knowledge of the tropical deep sea compare to that of high latitude? Oh, well, this is, this is going way beyond my expertise. And we might have to call in some of the actual marine bi biologists in the, in the uh, panel here. But- it, um, 
if I can, your interpretation of the attention given to the, uh, the two regimes in the studies that you alluded to might be uh, part of what the questioner was alluding to. Okay. Um, so um, can you repeat the question again for me? Yeah, basically, how does the knowledge of the tropical deep sea compare to that of high latitude? Yeah, um, well, I think in general, we're, we don't have as many studies in the high latitudes, um, you know, and, and we have more urgency in the Arctic and the Antarctic, given the changes that are happening there. So I think more attention has been placed um, on that. And you can see that with some of the expeditions, too, that the Schmidt Ocean Institute has undertaken. Um, you know, but it, you know, we have opportunity there to do better. But yeah, it's, it's still lacking. There's a kind of related issue brought up uh, by one of our questioners with respect to coordination between programs. And the question specifically is that there are numerous efforts underway to pursue another lasting program on marine biodiversity, but it's not clear uh, that they're well connected or coordinated. Based on the kind of history that you shared with us, do you think this is an issue that needs to be resolved? And, and if so, can it be resolved? I think, I think it is. I, th I think there, that it can be. And I, I think that there are the groups that are organizing have this in mind. I think they need to become better aware of one another. Um, and, I, and I think that's really where we have to put our efforts in making sure everybody knows what everybody's doing so that we can better connect to them. Because the ones that I'm aware of are, are already have that in mind. They want to serve as these big umbrellas and then we have to find the connections you know, between you know, which one is the greater umbrella, right? Maybe that's Marine Life 2030 because it would encompass the deep sea efforts um, as well as others. But you know, I, I think we, we can do that. The thing that is most essential and missing is the is the glue funding and so um you know we can connect these people but actually actually facilitating that coordination in a meaningful way is going to require funding that that we don't have right now we got a question regarding edna and i suspect one of our follow-on panelists might want to address this let me throw it at you if you've got some perspectives on it but if you want to defer it to the panel, that's fine too. We'll make sure to hold it. The question is how much is the eDNA approach for estimating biodiversity limited by lack of reference libraries for known and unknown species? Um, they could probably answer it more specifically, but um, I would assume that it is, it is a limitation. You know, I think we can go out there and we can collect these um, sequences, but if we don't know who they belong to, then it doesn't give us that much information. So. Yeah, let's hold that one. Uh, Leonard, I, in fact, I'd ask that we hold it and, and bring it to the panel's attention uh, after we hear from them. Uh, there's a very interesting question that came up and I'm gonna suggest this be the last one before we go to the panel. Um, and it has to do with um, uh, extractive ocean industries. And the question is, does this collaborative discovery just throw open the doors to profit-driven extractive ocean industries, some of which are backed by their government. Um, and I realize that's a broader global issue, but I think your perspectives based on your expertise would be welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly more information brings the potential for people who want to exploit what we find in these environments, but I think we have to, um, well, we need to know what's there um, because our, our well-being our well -being does depend on it. Um, and I think the more information we have, we just have to take sort of that optimistic view and say that, you know, it will help us really manage things better and, um, and maybe not uh, exploit certain ecosystems if, if we have the information that says we can't. But. Yeah, and I think that's a, a question that was, is going to be central to a lot of the discussion on sustainable development within the decade. Kristen, thank you so much for this introductory keynote. Uh, we're going to jump into the panel discussion in a minute, but first uh, we're gonna share a short video that highlights some of the diversity of species that have been discovered on previous uh, Falcor expeditions with the upcoming panelists.
I think the thing to keep in mind about this is actually the average ocean depth is nearly 4,000 metres. So the vast area of the world is at that depth or greater. And we've barely begun to really discover what is down there at that depth. Visually, we found this incredible solitary hydroid, a relative of corals and sea anemones that stood well over a metre tall. The imagery of that, I think, will become the iconic uh, picture for the cruise. I think that's likely to be a new species. I love arc volcanoes, which is where we've spent, you know, the beginning of this cruise because they're completely wacky and like nothing we've ever seen. Um, but it's always good to come back to a black smoker, especially a giant one that we've never seen before. One of the things we found at Daikoku was this giant clump of lamella brachia, two worms. We came here because we had seen that the deep sea fauna between Alaska and Hawaii were completely different. And so we hypothesized that there was a boundary. This is a part of the ocean that's extremely hard to get to. It's a long journey. This is really truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. If the deep sea is all one big unit, then you know you could put a few protected areas wherever it was convenient, and that would take care of it. But if the deep sea is in fact divided up into a bunch of biogeographic units, then it's important to have protected areas in each one. That is so cool. Uh, I've got to share with you, I was a grad student in the mid 70s when the French American mid ocean undersea study went out with a bunch of geologists and discovered biology uh, at, at sites they never expected to find it. Uh, and the, the imagery back then was mind blowing. Nobody would ever imagine the sort of high res, beautiful color imagery we're now getting. Uh, truly spectacular. And we're gonna get a chance now to hear from our panelists about some of the specifics and, and particular scientific discoveries associated with uh, those cruises and that imagery. Uh, let me introduce you to our three panelists, Dr. Julie Huber, Dr. Greg Grouse, and Dr. Les Watling. Starting with Julie, Julie is an associate scientist with tenure of marine chemistry and geochemistry at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Her research interests are marine microbiology, biogeochemistry, genomics, subsea floor biosphere, deep sea hydrothermal vents, and instrumentation. And with that, Julie, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Rick. Uh, brings back a lot of really wonderful memories seeing that footage. It's been a long time since I've been on the FALCOR. And I just put up this slide to show the three expeditions I participated in, actually with three different vehicles. Um, the Nereus ROV that took us to the world's deepest known hydrothermal vents in the mid Cayman Rise. Uh, the ROV Ropos, the Canadian vehicle, took us to Axial Seamount in the Northeast Pacific. And then that amazing footage you just saw was from the Mariana Back Arc, 
uh, taken with Sebastian. So I study the crustal ocean biosphere, which you just saw some amazing footage of. Basically all the beautiful features on our seafloor created uh, by plate tectonics shown there in the background. And on the next slide, you can see the biodiversity of the organisms I study, which is single cell microbial life um, associated with these habitats. Now we heard a lot about microbes from Mandy Joy and Peter Gurgis this morning. Uh, so I won't talk about them too much, except to say that the vast biodiversity on our planet is actually occupied by these microbial communities. Um, but in fact, the crustal ocean biosphere is all of the visible animals and this invisible microscopic life hosted in these crustal ocean habitats. Um, and on the next slide, I just want to remind you that besides being beautiful and awe-inspiring like that video, this crustal ocean biosphere actually provides a lot of critical ecosystem services. Uh, Lisa Levin spoke to this a bit uh, earlier this evening. But just to remind you, this includes primary production to sustain deep sea food webs. This is a source of discovery of valuable new products for marine genetic resources. Uh, this biosphere supports nutrient and element mobilization, and it forms really important habitat for animals, uh, both symbiotic and not. And I know we'll be hearing more about those animals from our other panelists. Uh, these environments help regulate climate change in the form of carbon sequestration. And of course, they have really important cultural and educational value. They're key to basic scientific research, as Peter Gurgis spoke to, from understanding the origins of life on Earth to the search for life beyond Earth. So in the next slide, I just want to remind everybody that despite our knowledge of these ecosystem services, uh, this biosphere remains largely unexplored and with few sites characterized, sort of the magnitude of the services is unknown and the value of them unconstrained. And I think that's a bit dangerous given there are these new emergent human uses of the crustal environment in the form of deep sea mining and carbon sequestration. So the spatial scale of these activities could really dwarf all other known human impacts in the deep sea and we just do not know the resiliency of these ecosystems to such perturbation. So in light of these types of potential activities, I and many other deep sea scientists believe there's really this urgent need for understanding the biosphere associated with ocean crust to inform whether or not we can do sustainable resource management down here. We really need to accelerate the exploration and the characterization of these habitats we need to determine its resiliency and we need to decrease the likelihood of serious harm and maintain these essential ecosystem services for the benefit of society. And platforms like the Falcor and the research we're able to do out there can help enable that while also inspiring future generations to think about the deep sea uh, in a variety of different ways. And so with that, I will hand it back to you, Rick. Thanks, Julie. Next, we're gonna hear from Dr. Greg Rouse. Greg is the curator of the Benthic Invertebrate Collection and professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at University of California, San Diego. Greg is uh, a researcher whose interests include animal phylogeny, biodiversity, and taxonomy, particularly annelids and echinoderms, the evolution of life history strategies in marine animals and evolution of whale fall, hydrothermal vents, and methane seep fauna. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rick. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to have been on three Falcor cruises, and I'll just tell you little stories from each of those. What you're looking at right now is a scan down a, a diffuse uh, venting chimney in the Pescadero Basin on the Gulf of California. And you can see a remarkable series of invertebrate animals as well as a massive microbial white mat there. And uh, this place uh, was my first Falco cruise back in 2018. And it revealed uh, a real, really amazing series of interesting animals that were not known from shallower hydrothermal vents that occur along the East Pacific rise. So this was a really remarkable place. And I'll tell you, a story about uh, one of the creatures we named from there 
uh, uh, just last year. So next slide, please, Alison. Uh, my goals are really to, in, when I'm involved in these kind of cruises, is to document the animal diversity for ecologist collaborators that I usually accompany along on these cruises, and then to provide this information on biodiversity to local researchers in the country or countries that we happen to visit. And this, uh, is particularly in the deep sea, uh, and we'll likely discuss this uh, about how many species there are still to name, is that I actually believe in naming the species as many as I can. And, and a lot of my time is spent in documenting this biodiversity and then physically naming the species. Uh, to do so, we do anatomical studies, uh, DNA sequencing, and then we want to put this together into big stories about their distribution. Uh, and the next one, please, Alison. And then we archive those into collections. So I'm a big believer in collections. So we send our specimens to experts around the world and archive any uh, others into the Scripps collections. And what you can see here is my second cruise uh, on top of uh, Mound 12, a methane seep at 1,000 meters off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, a really remarkable vista that we'll see in video on the next slide. And uh, when we went here, oh, sorry, keep going, please, uh, Alison when we visited this place, uh, and I've been visiting here with Lisa Levin and colleagues for the last decade or so, and we've described a, a really fascinating number of species, the most iconic of which is Kiwa Puravita there, the amazing Yeti crab that are dancing there in the methane and sulfide flow. But around it, you can see there are tube worms and mussels and all sorts of other animals. And many of those were really new species that in the last decade we've named. Um, next, please, Alison. And uh, just in this still, you can see uh, tube worms with the little red plume there. That was named after Don Walsh, uh, one of the first people down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. So that's Lamella brachia, Don Walshy, that we named in 2018. Uh, we named then two species of mussels from Mound 12 uh, from Falcor collections, as well as a, a shrimp, uh, uh, Albinocaris costa ricensis, and then some amazing feather worms that are sitting there on the rocks with white plumes coming out that. We just published with Shana Goffridi, a collaborator of mine for a long time, and that had a very novel symbiosis with methane utilizing bacteria that covered their plume, and no one had ever expected such a symbiosis would be discovered. In fact, all the animals you can see in this slide all have symbioses with, with bacteria, and this is a, a really remarkable, uh, fundamental, in interesting thing about methane seeps and hydrothermal vents, and, and the uh, importance of bacteria was highlighted by Julie in her talk uh, just before me. Next, please, Alison. So from Costa Rica, um, I'll go back to that Pescadero site. And what was really interesting about this place, or one of the many interesting finds, were these amazing worms that we had seen at many other places that have this beautiful iridescent scales. And we'd given them this nickname of Elvis worms for years. And as we gathered them, it became a fascinating story about their uh, evolutionary origin and then why they might have these remarkable scales. And what's so wonderful about the Falcor and the Sebastian is their amazing video capacity and the ability to get up close to these animals and observe them and behaving. And we got some amazing video of these animals actually fighting. And this one ended up being named after Victoria Orphan, a geobiologist at Caltech and one of my other longtime collaborators. And she was fascinated by these animals even though she's really a microbiologist uh, and we had great honor in naming that species for her. Next, please, uh, Alison. And uh, we put together an evolutionary story. We of course had to name one of the species after Elvis. This was from Monterey Bay, but then we named the one for Victoria as well as several other new species, including one for Shana Goffridi. Uh, next, please. And meanwhile, uh, I did was fortunate enough to be on the expedition to Northwestern Australia that occurred last February. And we uh, really found mostly benthic organisms, but part of our surveys allowed us to find pelagic organisms as well. And that's the most unexplored habitat in the world is this deep bathy pelagic region. And this creature I was involved in the first descriptions of back about 10 years ago, we called them squid worms, uh, toothed adrillus in Greek. And we found a new species that I'll be describing with one of my students and, and Australian collaborators. And then this next slide shows, and my final slide shows an amazing um, vista of the first leg of this particular series of cruises by Falcor that revealed these other amazing worms uh, that I'd also been involved in describing called green bombers. And 
Uh, I've never seen anything like this. These animals were, there were thousands of them and we managed to get a good collection of these. And we have four of these new species of pelagic worms to name on top of the original five that we named back 10 years ago. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to name these amazing creatures without the uh, Falcor and the Sebastian, we'd never would have found them. Uh, and we bring them up to the surface and I'll just finish with a few photos of these creatures to highlight. And there they are. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Greg. Um, I've got to say, I think that was the first presentation I've ever heard that invoked both Elvis Presley and Don Walsh. Uh, so uh, fascinating imagery, great story. Let's move to Dr. Les Watling. Uh, Les is a professor of biology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and emeritus professor of oceanography at the University of Maine's Darling Marine Center. His research interests include deep sea octocorals, crustaceans, conservation studies, ecology of marine sediment communities, community analysis of seamounts in the deep sea, and global biogeography of bathial and abyssal areas of the ocean. Les? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, yeah, as, as Rick indicated, I have a very wide range of interests in uh, marine invertebrates, particularly. And uh, I, uh, I tend not to think of these animals actually as aliens, which I, I find the title for this session kind of interesting. Um, the more you look at them, the more you can get a good idea of sort of how they live and how they're built, how they function in this, in this habitat. And admittedly, the deep sea is an unusual habitat in many ways, but the organisms are superbly adapted, uh, probably due to many millions of years of evolution uh, for living in these places. So my interests, um, I would say over the, well, I guess my interest in, the, in marine biodiversity started when I was a graduate student in the 1970s. And, uh, and I was fortunate to be on that um, National Research Council Marine Biodiversity Panel that Kristen started with. And one of the things that she quoted was uh, understanding the patterns and when I got, uh, I guess probably the last 10 years ago, I started uh, getting interested in global biogeography because it was clear that not since 1979, really, when the uh, Russian biologists published uh, uh, some ideas about biogeography in the deep sea, has anything, had anything actually been done? And there was then, uh, convened a meeting in Mexico City in 2007, um, where this whole idea about uh, biogeography and relationship to placement of marine protected areas was brought up. And, uh, and a group of us uh, concerned with the benthos, the animals that live on the bottom, uh, basically got our heads together and we realized that for large portions of the ocean, we didn't really have enough information about the organisms themselves uh, to propose a biogeographical scheme. So what we did was we decided to use water masses of the ocean as surrogates. And, uh, and so we wrote a report that came out in 2009 and then uh, revised it a bit and published it uh, uh, in Progress in Oceanography in 2013. Uh, but since then, uh, through OBIS, uh, which Kristen also mentioned, the huge collection of data actually being assembled in, on the world's oceans, but also the advent of these um, ROVs with fancy cameras, uh, like Greg just showed you, has allowed us to do an awful lot more. And uh, and I, my particular group right now is like the ones behind me in this image are the octocorals that are living on seamounts primarily. And, uh, and the things that live with them actually, or quite a few organisms live with them. But sorting out the taxonomy of, of these groups has helped us a lot in terms of, of getting a better picture of the global um, deep sea biogeography. Uh, and the idea of having uh, very fancy cameras on these ROVs, like 
as exists on Sebastian, is you can get very close. The ROV doesn't have to get very close, but the you can zoom the camera and get an extremely close image of the coral itself. And we've discovered that by playing around a little bit with the lighting and so on, we can actually see some of the characters that we, act, that we need to use to identify the, the coral. Depends from group to group as to how good that works, but you can get a pretty good estimation of whether you've ever seen that coral before or not. And on our Emperor Seamount's cruise, that was very valuable because we didn't know we were pretty sure there was a biogeographic break between the Aleutian Islands and, uh, and the Hawaiian Ridge uh, area, but we didn't know where it was. And uh, so we could, using the ROV images, we could get a pretty good idea, had we seen this thing before or not. And, uh, and then as we came down the chain, we could tell that we were in an area that we, where we hadn't seen things. And then all of a sudden, the next day, we were in an area where we had seen things. And so over a hundred kilometer distance, the, the fauna on the seamounts had completely changed. And uh, so the whole idea of having these modern exp exploratory tools is extremely valuable uh, to modern biogeographers. And I would have to say that there still aren't too many people doing this kind of modern biogeography, but, but I think that the, the advent of these tools is gonna allow us to do that. I'll turn it back to you, Rick. Thank you, Les. So we've got some time for uh, questions and they're already coming in from the audience and I'd encourage folks to uh, go ahead and type them in. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Kristen, and I would also uh, invite you to uh, join in answering the questions as you'd like. I wanna go back to the earlier question that was raised uh, regarding uh, eDNA and ask the panel uh, if you'd like to take a shot at it, let me reiterate. The question was, how much is the eDNA approach for estimating biodiversity limited by lack of reference libraries for known and unknown species? Anyone want to take a shot at that? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. I, I really think we need these uh, baseline references. Uh, the eDNA will give results and it'll give you an estimate of species richness and some estimates of biodiversity, but it's often nearly impossible to tag it to existing and known organisms. And so until you get in there and really do the baseline sequencing and lock it in with a, a known organism or an unknown organism, um, you, you can get some information, but in the end, uh, there's a really a large gap there about um, really understanding what eDNA can provide. I was going to add, this is a challenge with all these sequencing technologies and eDNA in particular, where you're just gathering free DNA from seawater. Um, and so you could be sampling something that was there maybe 12 hours ago, or maybe something that was just there. Uh, so it can be really challenging. I'd like to uh, follow up. Les, were you going to add something to that? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I would just say that that uh, I think the technique is promising, um, but uh, but we have a fair ways to go. Um, we've been building uh, through my colleague Scott France at Louisiana at Lafayette. We've been building a fairly strong database for the or the octocorals at any rate. And so uh, on our expedition, we did in fact collect water and filtered it with the hope that uh, we can see uh, to what extent uh, the record was in the water of the corals that we saw on the bottom um, or vice versa. Were there corals on, was there a signal in the water that was not recorded uh, in the video of, of the places that we dove on the, on the bottom? Thank you. I, uh, I would like to, um build on that question a little bit in the context of uh, technologies, seemingly disparate uh, technologies in science, if you will, that we in the ocean community are often the beneficiaries of technological development in what some call seemingly disparate scientific fields. Uh, one might argue eDNA is kind of like that. Applications of flow cytometry from biomedicine are another example. Do, do you see potential down the road for other technologies 
being adopted uh, within uh, or for the study of uh, deep sea biodiversity? Are there particular technologies you are eager to see us bring into the ocean community? Any thoughts? Uh, one I can identify is machine learning and, and identification of by machine learning, uh, where we can taste one of the things that you get overwhelmed with on these cruises is the sheer amount of video and uh, having the ability to have a database of images uh, that have been identified to then be used as a reference to then further identify other surveys, I think is something that's really going to come so that we, we can easily uh, really document the biodiversity from this incredible video that we have, but without having human annotation, we can use machine learning to do it for us. And I think that's really a, a developing technology that's here and uh, is really gonna become a boon. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, feature finding on the seafloor. We heard a little bit about that from the seafloor mapping group, but um, there are, you know, obviously hotspots of biological activity in the deep ocean, often associated with fluid flow, for example. Um, I think it was Lisa showed pictures of brooding octopus in this very, very diffuse water that's only a temperature, a degree or so warmer than the surrounding seawater. But being able to find those types of features autonomous, autonomously um, would definitely increase our ability to discover um, these hot spots of activity. Yeah, and I think that from my perspective, um, <clears throat> I would like to see the development of autonomous vehicles that could map huge areas uh, in terms of the biology, map huge areas of the, of the surfaces of seamounts. One of the problems that we have is that you do an ROV dive, it's about seven hours long or eight hours long or whatever. And what do you cover? About, I don't know, three quarters of a kilometer of the bottom. And, uh, and it would be really nice to have the same kind of high resolution imagery uh, on an autonomous vehicle that you could then send it around the seamount. <laughs> you know, we, we go up a ridge in one place, but it would be nice to have somebody or have a, have a vehicle drive for, you know, 14, 15, 25, 36 hours going along collecting images and uh, so that we could see how widespread some of these communities are. We don't have any idea at all. I mean, I think in the New England Seamounts on Kelvin Seamount, we managed to do over a period of several years, we did like seven dives on that one Seamount. And I think, you know, that's about the maximum I know about for any particular place where there's good high resolution ROV imagery. So interesting in, in the response is the application of AI, feature detection, uh, more sophisticated platforms for gaining imagery. One of our questions from uh, Anne uh, Bourne is associated with other kinds of uh, sensing capabilities. Specifically, are there any scientists recording audio of the deep ocean and the new species that are being discovered? All the documentation seems to be visual without sound documentation of the species in their habitat with audio that is not obscured by the sound of the technology? Is that uh, being done? Is that possible? That, that is being done. Um, but for example, you need an electric uh, ROV, just as one example, because these hydraulic vehicles, they're very, very loud. But we have done things like left a hydrophone on the seafloor, for example, for a while. Um, and you hear all sorts of interesting things. We left our hydrophone next to an exploding volcano. So we heard amazing <laughs> rumbles and cracks. But in, I know recently acoustic scientists have deployed sensors in the Mariana Trench, for example, and heard some fascinating sounds, whale migrations, things like that. Um, but it is hard when you have all the noise, for example, from most of our commonly used vehicles. Yeah, and from the ship too, probably. Right. <laughs> I had uh, prepared a question, a very different uh, subject on the uh, development of taxonomists of the future. And fortunately, 
uh, Andrea Quattrini in our audience has put together a much more eloquent version of the question. Let me read that to you. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the importance of biodiversity, voucher specimens, number of undescribed species in the deep sea, etc. But we know that training taxonomists is unfortunately becoming less of a priority today. Do you have any advice for what we should do as a community to support taxonomist training and funding for this kind of work? Uh, I, I can have a stab at that and hi, Andrea. Uh, I, uh, what I really recommend, and I try and do this with people who work with me, is to make taxonomy part of their toolkit. So rather than have people be specialist taxonomists, at least to try and be an expert in a particular area and that you take responsibility to be a taxonomist, it's very difficult to get funding to simply name species. That's uh, seems to be a, a, a past uh, endeavor that's well funded. Uh, these days, NSF really, for instance, doesn't provide a lot of direct funding for systematics and taxonomy. But if you make it part of your toolkit, if you work with people who uh, make and insist that the things they work on have names, then it potentially is a way to um, rebuild taxonomy, if, if you will. And whereas we might not have as many dedicated taxonomists um, who spend all their career just being taxonomists, I would suggest we have more people who know a bit about taxonomy and have the ability to name species, especially in this day of of DNA sequencing and, and ease of, uh, of techniques. Um, the, the, there are some barriers to taxonomy and the rules are a bit uh, obscure, but uh, that said, in the end, if you work with someone uh, and get some basic training, I think it's not too onerous. I just, I just think it's something that we should ask our colleagues to step up and make sure they do as part of their research. Yeah, I would just add that microbial taxonomy is really, really confusing. And it started by culturing an organism back in the laboratory and describing what it was eating, what temperatures it grows at. But we know that the things we have in our labs as cultures represent probably 5% of what's out there. And so people have been naming groups based simply on DNA sequences and the literature is just a mess. You know, you build a tree of any particular organism and, and the names change all the time. Um, so I think it's, it's a really big challenge for the future. There's a lot of great minds working on it, but it is especially challenging when you can't just pick up a single microbe and, you know, send it to the museum. Um, you know, uh, I, think, I think bringing together molecular and the taxonomic skills that Greg uh, describes is super important. There's a great term for what Julie just described and it's uh, coined by Rod Page and it's called dark taxa. There are these things we know often because of DNA and they sit on GenBank, but they don't have names. And it's uh, very common for microbes, but it's absolutely exploding for animals and, and other taxa as well. Yeah, there's, there's been quite a, there's actually been a giant argument raging on the taxonom, taxicom list over the last uh, week or so about uh, describing naming species just from DNA sequences. And uh, so I, th I think the, the, the field is kind of sort of progressing really fast uh, in that area. But I also think that, um, that Greg had his finger on the right thing, which is that is, if you're gonna work with organisms, you know, you should learn to describe the organism that you're working with rather than just leaving it as a, you know, some kind of genus SP or something. And, uh, you know, the, the routine use of taxonomy is no longer sort of a part of the curriculum, even of, you know, evolutionary biologists. And uh, it seems like that would be a small but concrete step forward if if people who are working with the evolution of some group took the time to describe the new things that they found in that group. All of this um, really circles around the issue of knowing how many species are there. And I wanna harken back uh, first, Kristen, to uh, a slide that you had and a comment that you had about the change in the estimates of the numbers of 
uh, species uh, in, in the ocean, including microbial species. Um, and then broaden the, so the question for you, Kristen, is why is that important? Why is it important to know that number of unknown, if you will? The broader question uh, goes to the one Mike Coffin raised here, where he says, I've seen global estimates uh, of microbial species ranging from 10 to the fourth to 10 to the 12th. Does this group of experts have a preferred number or reference for the microbial species in the ocean? So two part question. First part for you, Christian, why is it important to know that? And the second, it, is there a preferred uh, reference that the community looks to right now? Um, well, I think uh, part of the answer to that is, is level of effort and knowing how close you are to reaching your goal. But I think more importantly, um, you know, because we don't have a good understanding of our impact on biodiversity and what that's going to do to the services that we benefit from from the ocean, if we don't know what's there, then we don't know when it's lost, we don't know when it's changed. There's um, there's a lot about the function that we'll never know if we if we don't have that information. So, yeah, and, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead, Julie, please. So in direct uh, response to the question. So I worked on the, the census of marine microbes um, and we published some of these first estimates for what we thought the number was. And within a year, someone else published something that said we had overestimated by, you know, a hundred times and then Someone else said we've been underestimating by a thousand times. So it's, you know, it's really hard when all you're actually doing is sequencing a single gene of all the microbes you can detect in a single sample, and then you're just extrapolating. Um, but as Kristen mentioned in her remarks, what we do see is some very common globally distributed organisms, but then just a ton of rare organisms where we only pick up their DNA infrequently. And that's what we term the rare biosphere. And it actually makes up this vast diversity of microbes on our planet. And it makes those estimates, those global estimates really challenging. Yeah, I wonder if I could just add also uh, to Julie's point is that, you know, all these invertebrates that, that are out there also are covered in microbes. And, uh, and some people have been industri industriously working away at finding out who the microbes are that are on the deep sea corals. But what about all the other invertebrates? Uh, you know, <laughs> there, there, there could be microbes of all types that we have no idea about that, that uh, develop symbioses with some of these, with a lot of these other organisms. And then if we just talk on the animal diversity, Many animals, including ourselves, have a pretty big parasite load, and, and that's also reflected <laughs> in the marine animals as well. So yeah. there's a massive undescribed biodiversity there. Uh, now, I'll just comment on, uh, Kirsten showed this uh, sort of declining estimates of biodiversity of animals and named species to be discovered. And it all depended on the experts that they were asking and the models that they made. And, and it's really a very tricky thing to describe. And uh, I would just say that with burgeoning DNA technology, I think a lot of that really wasn't considered in those models. And I think uh, that there, there really were big underestimates in, in those papers. Thank you all. We have uh, just about a minute or two. And so what I'd like to do is very quickly uh, do a lightning round. You each have somewhere between 20 and 30 seconds to answer the following question. Uh, tomorrow, NASA will put a lander on Mars it will undoubtedly get top billing on most of the news stations. I want you to envision that you get a phone call from a CNN producer tomorrow. And they say, we've got 30 seconds of, of uh, time available for our um, prime time report. We're gonna either do a report on the Mars lander or on something really interesting having to do with deep sea biodiversity. What is your answer to that producer? Kristen, you wanna start? And like I said, 20 to 30 seconds. Oh gosh, um, I, I guess it would maybe relate to some of these rare earth minerals and mining, um, and you know, trying to connect, um, you know, conservation of, of biodiversity to like our cell phones and the other things that uh, that are going to cause a lot of pressure on those systems. Great, thank you, Julie. I would show them footage from that Mariana Backart cruise of this 
bizarro molten sulfur volcano that had crabs and flatfish. Um, when we streamed that video back to land, people were asking us if it was Earth. Uh, just to remind people there are such foreign and confusing habitats on our own planet, uh, let alone Mars. Greg? Agreed. Our own world uh, has its own hidden and unexplored worlds. And why don't we get to know ours a whole lot better uh, rather than emphasize another place that we have re remote chances of ever colonizing? And Les, you get the final word. Well, I would say that uh, if we studied our own ocean better, we might be able to recognize a fossil if it showed up on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Great answers all around. I'll be sure to send the CNN reporters to you all. Uh, Kristen, <laughs> Julie, Greg, Les, uh, what a terrific discussion. Thank you so much for taking some of your time and sharing your perspective. A, a wonderful discussion on deep sea biodiversity. With that, we're about to secure the after deck and tie the line. So I'll throw it over to Jodica to close us out for the day. Thank you, Rick. That was a really interesting panel. And it's evident that we have a long way to go to knowing who we share our own home planet with. But it is good to know, Julie, that we've got the footage to compete with a Martian landing. Um, so I know we're at the end of our time together, and I want to thank all the speakers, panelists, and moderators for such an amazing few hours of discussion as we dove into the final frontier, looking at extreme environments, seafloor mapping, biodiversity, and hearing from artists who talk about how their experiences were translated to reach a diverse audience. If you missed any of today's sessions, they will be posted on this feed loop site later today, and all sessions will also be posted to the Schmidt Ocean Institute website and YouTube page next week for public viewing. Tomorrow, we move back to the future and look forward to the decade ahead. And I want to remind you all that due to the international nature of this event, tomorrow's schedule will actually start an hour earlier and it will end an hour earlier too. Um, I look forward to seeing you all here and um, I will wrap up as I started this earlier today by wishing you all a good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night wherever you are on this ocean world. Thank you. <laughs>